Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Live Force Friday uh, YouTube session with me, Mike Matese. Uh Today we have uh, Mr. Swenley with us. Let's say a quick hello. How's it going, Swenley? Ah, good. Uh, again, uh, one of my favorite subjects, drawing from imagination. And I think for both of us, this like the reason why we started drawing, right? We had all these ideas and we needed the skills to, to be able to express them. So I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, that's true. I think it's probably true for most, you know, not to go into a giant thing on the evolution of an artist, but uh, I think most of us start as little kids that draw from imagination. And then all of a sudden that becomes us in high school wanting to be really accurate and drawing from reference and copying really well. And then we kind of return to, man, now I really want to draw from imagination. Right. And there's this problem, right? There's this problem in drawing from imagination with um, trying to get from that reference aspect over to, you know, drawing out of your head. And we've talked about that in the past with you guys that that isn't a prior video. So go check that out. Today, we're going to talk more about how to get over the, the, the block of having that blank page. You always hear this with writers, right? Like the writer's block, like, you know, what am I going to write about? We're going to talk a little bit more today about the artist's block. Um, I have a bunch of um, uh, ideas to help you come up with ideas uh, about what to draw. Uh, you know, I have to also say, um, from a professional standpoint, as a prior art director and creative director and business owner in, in the field of the arts, um, most, you know, I think people on the outside, outside of the arts, think like artists are creative, but that's not necessarily true. You know, a lot of us are artists and you learn that as a skill. It's like being a plumber. I always bring up the plumber as an idea. Like, you know, you're learning a skill, you're learning how to draw, uh, but recognize the fact that most of us, including myself, um, most of my life was going and getting jobs in the arts. I was in animation, I was in video games and advertising and, Somebody else actually came up with the initial kernel of the idea, right? It might be a creative director, typically a, typically a writer, right? Typically a writer. You know, if you want to get a job at Disney Animation, for instance, in feature, you're not the one who comes up with the idea. A writer comes up with the idea, right? That initial thought and the director jumps onto that. Sometimes that's one and the same person. Uh, and then you're asked to help visualize those ideas. So your creative piece is not the coming up with the idea. It's coming up with a picture for that idea, right? You're, you're the visual, right? So it's something to be aware of. So if you're somebody out there today who's with us and is like, oh, I love drawing and I love painting, but I have a hard time coming up with ideas, that, that's very normal is what I want you to be aware of. It's very normal. And, um, and there's lots of different ways of finding things to go and draw or paint, right? And we're going to share that with you. And then on top of that, we're not only going to cover that today, we're also going to cover... Um, once you start drawing from imagination, we've seen, Swanling Ratunjay and I, we have seen um, challenges that come along with that, right? There's, there's the very obvious, which is knowing how to draw, right? And we're kind of going to, um, we're going to make belief here that everyone knows how to draw pretty darn well, especially from reference. And you're here today because you're like, I draw pretty well already. I understand reference. I understand how to study and analyze but I wanna go into this imagination thing. What do I need to know? What are some of the traps? You know, how do I come up with an idea and what are the traps that I could get around when I'm doing that? And that, that's today's conversation. So hopefully you have a good time with us today again. I think we have some really great um, advice to share with you. So I'm gonna pick this up and get us started. If I may add um, to the creative part, it's funny that you mentioned that because when I used yeah. to freelance full time as a character designer and illustrator, I remember that my best creative times, like I was, I was like hungry for clients to come to me with great ideas. You know, like I worked with clients who had like whole uh, universes and, and worlds fleshed out and they would come with these uh, like uh, character design Bibles and style guides. And that's the, those were the moments that I could be the most creative, you know, because there was so much ideas to, to, to draw out and visualize instead of me trying to come up with things from scratch. So it's funny that you mentioned that. I didn't like really consciously think about that in the past. Mm -hmm. 
I know it's kind of strange, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about it, <laughs> but uh, it's like, oh, you know, I'm an artist, I'm creative. And it's like, oh, you know, I mean, I, I run, I've run many times in my life up against like, what do I want to draw today? You know, like I want to draw, I'm interested in drawing, but what do I want to do? And then you stagnate, you get bored, you, you lose momentum, you lose um, drive, right? To, to go out there and figure out what to draw. And, and, and what you're saying in a sense is not only does somebody come with you with some kernel of the thought, but you, that also creates restraint, right? It's not like, you know, when you sit there and you're like, what am I going to draw today? It, well, it could be anything, right? It could be anything. It, it could be a bug. And you're like, I'm going to create a whole superhero cultural culture that's made out of bugs. I'm going to draw trains today. I want to draw architecture and trees. I want to create a whole new sci-fi civilization that lives underwater and they, they ride on seahorses, right? Like, you know, it, it can go anywhere, right? So that, that's in a way what makes it hard. When you get these jobs as an artist, you've been like restrained very quickly down and it helps your brain focus, right? So I do think that's one of the things that really does help to your point, you know? And I just want you guys to be aware of that and respect that, respect the idea that you're working with people who had to do the hard work of coming up with the idea, right? And that hopefully it's good and it's interesting in the first place, you know? So, all right, yeah, thanks for adding that. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's go to it, right? Um, so this is just, a, I, I put this up here as a thumbnail. Uh, this is a sketch of just showing also, like typically I'll rough something out and go to this. Sometimes I don't even do this stage. Obviously the better you get at drawing, you don't even bother with this, you just kind of draw. Um, and this is tighter for me than what you guys normally see, but here's something that's actually semi-finished. Like I could take this and paint it, for instance, you know, it's got, it's got this kind of Gibson, uh slash frazetta thing going on with what i call surface line right so you can go through that process so let's get into this right i i, I the way i teach and the way i think is i always try to step out as far as i can that's hierarchy right we talked about hierarchy before so here i am and i'm trying to step out of this concept of how to draw from imagination after learning force well there's there's sort of two ways to go uh one is that you have a preconceived idea that's really the one we're going to talk about today by the way um, and then there's also draw to search and find, right? So from a pyramid standpoint, they're kind of an inversion of one another. Maybe you've seen me do this in the past, I don't recall, but I, I always think of myself as teaching like this. It's like, we're trying to get to the top of the pyramid, right? And this is the big idea, right? Uh, big, two Gs, <laughs> big idea, right? The other, so, and this, this is, uh, this is a little more, a little more planned. And then we flip this upside down. So this goes on in my mind. I'm, I'm very consciously aware of like, what am I doing, you know, with, with, uh, with process. I'm always very aware with process. I got to say, I'm a very process oriented artist. Uh, and I think that helps me teach you guys, you know, because I'm, I'm aware of like, how do I step you guys through this, right? So the other side is to come in from the small stuff, right? The little stuff. So this is like, you know, this is detail. And I would recommend, I would say that if I were to put another phrasing on this, I would say this is like conscious. And this is what I call stream of conscious or consciousness, right? Stream of conscious, let's put down. Conscious, right? Stream of conscious. So here you're, you're kind of doodling to discover. It's fun. You know You know who does this really well is, uh, I have to say really, really well, is uh, Gary uh, Via Real, right? Gary's excellent at this. Uh, you know, we did a, if you look on the channel, on this channel, after today's session, you go down to where we have uh, interviews. You'll see there's an interview with Gary, and he's he's like amazing at this. I have a friend named John who's amazing at this. Like he, in fact, I'd say most of his life he lives like this creatively. He's like kind of the inverse of me. I usually come in with like the bigger picture stuff, and he goes from detail and like blows things out. Right. So very interesting this yin yang between he and I. Right. So this is process. Like I said, I'm going to talk mostly about this today. Let's just talk about this very quickly. Let's call this number one and number two. So number two, what Gary might do or someone like my friend John might do 
they just start drawing, you know, and you don't even know what you want. Sometimes you're just like this and you're making scribble up and you start finding stuff in the scribble. It's like, oh, wait a minute. That, that looks like a kind of cartoony head right there that I just drew, right? Well, maybe, maybe it's not a cartoony head. Maybe it's a mermaid. I'm starting to see this, right? And I start making something up out of it, you see? So that's one way, right? That's one way of like going about this. You see what just happened there? All right, so I found something. So you're finding, right? You're discovering just by noodling your way around. Like I said, Gary and John are like masterful at this, right? And it's fun, it's fun. I myself, my brain likes, I like, I like the challenge of saying, let me come up with a problem. That's the idea. The idea in a way is a problem. Let me see if I can figure it out and solve it. This is way more laid back, <laughs> I have to say, right? Way more casual and laid back to just enjoy the discovery of things. So, you know, those of you in the audience today, you'll, you'll know yourselves better than I do as to, you know, which kind of artist are you? Maybe you're this and you want to learn a little bit more about the planning thing today, which, like I said, we're going to talk about. Or maybe you're a heavy planner like I am. And you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I should, I should try that out, right? I think they're both super valid. They both do different things. And they get you to, you know, they get you to a fun place either way, right? So what I really want to talk about today is this massive list that I put together for you guys. How to come up with preconceived ideas, right? So these are goals. You're trying to come up with concepts. Uh, one thing I didn't write here, which I, is I would recommend writing, right? Writing is a big deal. So write down your ideas. We just talked about how most of uh, creativity comes from us actually working off of other creatives, usually writers, right? You do a comic book, there's typically a writer. Sometimes the penciler is the writer. Those are what I call like these uber creatives, right? Because they also have the concept. And they have the ability to draw, right? So that's a huge one-two punch, right? Uh, but not always, right? And what we want to try to do today is help you become more of that kind of person. But write down your ideas, right? Very big deal. Uh, you know, I don't want to derail with this whole thing. And I, I do want to dig into this more. But as most of you know, there's like this whole conversation around AI that's going on right now. And the irony here is it's writing, right? So writing gets you again to better art, right? It's like, how well do you write? How well do you describe the imagery you want? Now, I got to say, I'm actually pretty proud of what we teach at drawingforce.com because we talk about writing there. You know, part of what we teach is, is writing um, what you're after in the poses, right? So there's goals and that immediately connects to coming up with ideas. It immediately connects to AI and being able to write exactly what you want. So there's power in that writing. And again, those are the people that you team up with for jobs, right? It's these writers. So write your stuff down. So the first note here is the most obvious one, which is the internet, right? We all use Google search. Google search is, is great, right? Uh, it's very different than what um, I had to work with when I was probably the age of most of you out there watching right now, because um, there was no internet. All right, believe it or not, I grew up in a world with no internet, <laughs> right? Um, so the internet's great, but what's bad about the internet? Well, you know what's bad about the internet is there's a couple of things. The first thing is it's only as good and as creative as you are, right? It only gives you what you ask of it. And the problem here is trying to come up with ideas. So if you always type in the same things, I can see yourself getting stuck in a place of monotony or boredom, right? It's like, well, I keep typing in pirates, right? Like I always come up with pirates as like a, a, an idea to draw, right? And that limits me, right? Because I'm looking at the same thing over and over again. So the answer I have to this, I'm going to jump around with these numbers. Um, the answer I have for this, and I just had one of my mentees go through this actually, was I sent him over to the library, believe it or not, right? Like, let's go old school. Why? Why does this work? Why is it any better than the internet or is it better than the internet? I think it is, you know, not all the time. The internet's great because it's endless, but I would start with the library because the library is like Google search in front of you in its entirety, right? Remember the internet only works. It's a funnel, right? It's only as good as what you type in, right? Um, but the library, all of the images are up there, right? So 
I suggested to this one student, I said, hey, go and look. I usually go to like the oversized book area because that's where all the photography and like imagery is, right? You don't have to only go there, but I usually peruse around the oversized book area. And you start seeing things you would not think of looking at, right? Like, like uh, gemstones, right? Precious gemstones. I would never look at that. I have no interest in that, honestly, at all, right? But when I look at it there and I pull a book off the shelf and I flip through it, I remember when I was working on creating cartoon ideas and I lived in LA and even film and game ideas, I was like, whoa, this gemstone would be amazing as a prison, right? The cut of it and the shape of it, the styling of it. I'm like, wow, that would be amazing as a prison, right? For these, these creatures that I, was, that I had in my story. I, I would never have come up with that, right? You see, so I highly recommend go visit the Dawn Library. You know, it's still an amazing uh, resource. You can take books out. It's free, right? And it gives you Google search on the wall, right? With subjects that you normally would not look at. Okay, super powerful. And it really helped this one student. I have to say, he came up with things that he would not normally think of, right? And and he took photographs of some of the photos in the books and he could take that home. And I just got reference on his phone that he could put on his computer and take a look at it in that way, you see? So really, really awesome. Personal stories, right? So here we checked off this guy. So we've got personal stories, number two. This one is, is tricky as well. Some of you might say, you know, I live a pretty boring life, <laughs> right? Like nothing exciting has happened. Um, but I can promise you that you've had something in your life that's worth drawing. It can be something as simple as just sitting down and eating lunch, okay? It's still something to draw. So something dramatic has happened in your life. And, you know, those personal stories, those are the ones that really connect with the rest of us, by the way. Even if you're watching, like, like I just finished watching the new season of Game of Thrones and I'm looking at Lord of the Rings right now. And, you know, those things only matter. Those stories only matter really if at the core it's personal, right? You can attach yourself to it. Like, no, I've never ridden a dragon. I've never had to deal with those things, but I've dealt with, uh, having children, uh, fear of somebody dying, right? Like I've gone through all of that stuff, right? Those are the things that are in these shows. So it's worth you thinking about your own personal stories to actually illustrate, right? So that's that's a that's a huge space. I'm I'm teaching a student right now who just came out of the Pixar internship, and even at Pixar, you know, one of the tests they had not tests, one of the projects they had was, um, you know, storyboard a personal story, right? Like. They're aware of it, you know, they know exactly the power of that because that's what you bring to the table as a creative, not as an artist, not as a skilled artist, but as a creative individual is your life's story. Pixar loves that, okay? They love that. They want that in the people that come and work there. Those are the things that creep into their stories, right? That's why they're so emotional because they're, they're building off of reality, right? And then because of that, you connect to it. And then you're sitting there crying or laughing or frustrated or angry, whatever it may be, right? So personal story is a huge one. I think this is super, super important, really valuable to dig into, okay? Then there's fiction and nonfiction books. My personal, my personal story on this is, I remember when I was in New York and I started, um, I wanted to start storyboarding. Um, I, grabbed, um, I grabbed Jurassic Park, actually, before the movies came out. I grabbed the book Jurassic Park. It sounded like something I'd be interested in. And I read parts of, well, I read the whole book and then I took parts of it and I storyboarded out those scenes and those boards got me jobs. I got jobs in New York in advertising based off of boards I did off of this fiction book before the film came out, which was cool because then when the film did come out, I was like, oh, there's a scene I boarded. Let me see if they did it any differently or not, or what was the same, right? Which I loved. I loved seeing that like change, you know, like what are the tweaks in there? So this is endless. This is endless, right? These fiction, nonfiction books. Just that alone means you never have an excuse ever again to not have something to draw, right? There's like no excuse. There's just so much out there in the world to look at and to read that you can dig into, right? Um, going back to the student at Pixar, one of the other um, assignments was one of Aesop's fables, right? So they had to take a fable and convert it into storyboards. There it is again, right? So you can see they, they themselves, right at Pixar, are moving off of many of these different projects, right? So we got to the library, oversized books. 
Um, the one that Swami Matunji and I bring up a lot with students at the beginning is just themes in general, right? Like I mentioned pirates, you might be doing an underwater thing, right? You're doing mermaids and you're doing fantasy and dragons, science fiction, Arthurian times, dystopian sci-fi, right? Horror, right? Like there's so many different things out there from like genres or themes that you can go after uh, to draw, right? And you know, I have to say, uh, and I didn't even tend to bring this up today, but it just popped in my head. Um, something that wraps around all of these things that is super powerful, that drives all of this is this, and this, this is more important than almost any of it, is curiosity. The students that I teach, the ones that come in with uniqueness and that always are motivated, that never lack motivation, are the students that are the most curious, you know? I've got this one student that I teach uh, in South Korea and uh, he's like my young genius. You know, he comes in with stuff. He's, he's teaching me like half the sessions. He comes in with things I've never even heard of, you know? And I'm like double his age, right? And he comes in with all kinds of weird stuff that, that he brings to my attention. And he's, he's like endlessly curious. And we just talked about it this past week. I was like, what keeps doing that? You know, like, why are you so driven? He's like, I love, I love the hunt right? He loves the hunt to getting to like the answer to some question he has. So let's put that up here too, right? Questions, right? Questions drive curiosity, right? So he always has like these questions that he has, and then he, he loves the hunt of finding the answer and finding the best answer. And he's learning, right? He's learning along the way of the hunt, right? The hunt teaches him. So it's super powerful. You know, if you're an artist who is finding yourself kind of bored, then it's typically a lack of curiosity. And what I'm giving you are ways to build that curiosity, right? Different tools of the bridge to curiosity to find things that you'd be interested in. And then therefore all of a sudden you wanna draw it, right? You wanna get on the other side. You're not, again, you're not just a skilled artist. You're trying to be the writer in a sense, right? The creative person, okay? It just brought to attention something else for me. I have another student who started playing Dungeons and Dragons again. And that is hyper creative. I played D&D as, as a kid and I still remember campaigns. I still remember them as if they were real stories, you know, as, as if they happened to me, right? And it's endless creativity, right? You're like inventing, you know, and that, that student, you know, he's even brought up like how he loves really digging into it, creating a whole narrative, right? For the, for the players, right? So that's an awesome place too. And I, I would even add that down here. I would say RPG, right? Or role-playing gaming, anything like that. That's always great too. So we've got themes, right? We talked about themes. We just went on this little tangent with curiosity and questions. Questions drive it, right? What am I interested in drawing, right? What are the things that I'm interested in, right? That's a great question to start this whole search. Now here's um, one plus one equals three. This is one of my personal favorites. It's when you take a thing like science fiction and it's like, I love sci-fi and I'm gonna mix it with fantasy. Boom, I have this whole new thing. What do you got? Oh, you got Star Wars, right? It's like we have guys running out with swords, right? And armor, but it's science fiction, not fantasy, but there's monsters, right? There's creatures walking around. You know, what's going on here, right? <laughs> like we keep skating across these two genres and that makes an amazing new thing, right? It's experimentation two things that are common come together and make something uncommon. So it's a great way of you taking all of the prior stuff we talked about. You may have a book that you really like that you've read that's fiction and another one that you read last year that you really like. And it's like, ah, what if I combine those two, right? What happens in there that nobody's ever seen, including yourself, right? And you're really interested. You're curious about what that would be like, right? So I love this one. One plus one equals three. This is how I develop my cartoon ideas. So this doesn't just go to like one drawing or a piece of art. Imagine taking shows that are out there now and combining them. It's like, what if I mixed Jaws with the Nutcracker? <laughs> like, what happens there? What does that turn into? You know, what if I take Beauty and the Beast and I mix it with uh, aliens? What does that mean, right? Like, how does that work? right? All of a sudden your brain starts going, whoa, like how does that work? I start writing, I start sketching, right? New ideas show up, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. I love this one. To me, this is like a stick of dynamite, you know? 
Music. So music can work in lots of different ways. It could be music because you love the, um, the lyrics. You know, the lyrics are what are really driving you. And you get pictures from that. Um, I always love that one song. Um, ah, I'll get back to it. I don't want to waste time thinking about it. There's this one song um, about a guy uh, racing cars and this like love interest he has and like losing this race, going the distance, right? There's a song called Going the Distance, uh, which I really like. And I always, I, could, I visualize that whole thing. I'm always like, man, someday if I had the time, I would love to do I would love to animate this as a music video, right? Like it's just in my head. I could see all the pictures and it's super dramatic. Uh, sometimes it could just be um, orchestral. I like listening to soundtracks when I don't want to pay attention to lyrics and those in, that creates images in my mind, right? So that's what you're trying to do, right? Spur on imagery, spur on imagery, right? Uh, so here we're getting to the end here. Uh, exaggerate a thought, right? So you might have a small idea explode it, right? Stick the stick of dynamite into it, right? Um, so maybe it was like, you know, at the early, earlier I said, it could be a personal story and you're just sitting and eating lunch. But what if you're sitting and eating lunch and the table is full of food and now it's like this long table and now all of a sudden you're a king and you're in a castle and you see like by me building up and exploding it and exploding and making it bigger and bigger and bigger, it leads me to things that are interesting to me, you see? So it leads to different directions. And these, by the way, they're all not separate from one another. These are totally, um, you have total ability to make these integrative, right? Like how do they connect to one another? Then, man, now you're really sitting on a, like I said, a, a pile of dynamite. Last but not least, this kind of is like the exaggerate thing a little bit, but is the idea of contrast. You know, I may have said this again before, but one of the main lessons I learned in Disney animation was contrast creates interest, right? Contrast creates interest. That's not only in art, that's in the writing aspect of things. Uh, you know, I, that's some, for me in film, it's some of the things that make me laugh the most for all of us really is when there's contrast. So if you watch stand up, you'll notice it's contrast. That's a great way of creating a gag, right? So take the emperor's new groove, right? The Disney film, you got this villain, the female villain, right? At the end, all of a sudden she turns into a cat. It's like the most contrasted thing she could become is this cute little cat, yet it's mean and evil. It's really funny, right? That's how all those like baby movies, you know, work, right? You have little babies doing crazy things, right? It's, it's the contrast. It's a scale contrast. It's a voice. Con Sometimes it's an audible contrast. It's really creative. Look at the Star Wars films. We'll go back to that. The lightsabers, you know, you got green lightsabers and red lightsabers, right? It's like watching... Christmas, <laughs> right? You got green and red, you got opposing colors going on there, right? So there's no accident in this stuff. You got black to white, right? You got Darth Vader, you got stormtroopers, you have some of that black in there, then you have all these like white costumed troops, you know, the shapes of the ships, right? Round to triangular, sharp and planar to pointy, more rounded, contrast, 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 right? So not only in the visuals, but like I said, also in the writing and the conceptual side of things, okay? So I'm sure there's more, right? And I see some of you typing here. I haven't read through the comments yet, but this is a strong starting point. I, this probably, I've probably given you more like 11 ideas here. Once you start combining, there's way more. Uh, this has got to work, right? There's got to be something in here that's going to help you come up with an idea that will inspire you to illustrate. You know, I happen to be a big World War II buff, right? It's like, I can easily watch World War II and just sit down and draw from, let's say, a documentary and help that lead me somewhere. Maybe I exaggerate that. It's like, wow, what if I took World War II and really exaggerated, pushed it forward? What if I turned World War II into a fantasy film, right? What does that look like? And to what degree do I do that? There's already been some kind of crazy tongue-in-cheek films in that space that I'm sure you guys have seen, like Nazis on the Moon. <laughs> I forget the name of the film. But that kind of stuff has happened, right? That's how people get there, right? You see, that's how this stuff gets made. Okay, uh, I want to take a quick look at this and then I'll go on to my next subject and then Mertunjay will be up after me. So Daniel says, I use a library for serendipity to find books that I would never read. Yeah, I also like to look at boxes where people leave used books. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, man, it's the first thing I look at when I go to um, antique shops, stuff like that. The first place I beeline to is the books. All right. I'm always curious to see if I find some old books, some old picture book where of something I just have never seen before. Right. 
Don, uh, Craig says, I use, I buy used books from the swap meet for 50 cents reference. Yeah, exactly. So awesome. Uh, Counterpasta, every day before I draw, I write down a gratitude, optimism, curiosity, excitement. It's a great point. Yeah, fantastic. That's such a great practice. Uh, da, 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 da. Dalric, hey, Dalric. And number eight is my fave. My internal editor tends to shoot down ideas quickly before I can flesh them out. But if I let it go to exaggerate or ridiculous and then go from there, somehow it skips. Yeah, that's such, that Dalric brings up a really um, important piece uh, that corporate creative spaces have learned. And it really comes from, um, oh God, it really comes from the idea of doing improv, right? If you join an improv group, one of the first lessons they teach you is there's no such thing as no. You're supposed to yes everything, right? Because as soon as you know it, you kill the improv, right? You stop the opportunity for progress and for this thing that everybody as a team is making up, right? So you want to yes things to death and let it let it fly, right? See where it goes, right? So Dalric's kind of doing that through the exaggerated piece, right? You're letting it move forward, move forward. So don't don't kill your ideas. You never know where a silly idea is going to take you to an amazing idea, right? Don says cake is one of my fit. Yeah, cake. Thank you. That was going the distance. Thank you, thank you. Yes, cake. That's such a great song. For those of you interested, yeah, go listen to uh, "Going the Distance" by Cake after this and close your eyes. Listen to the lyrics. Yeah, so awesome. Um, all right, I got that one from Steve Houston. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, Steve's been around obviously a long time, and that's I think those are great tools. Okay, so now that we've got ideas, right? The next one of the next things to think about the, the next the next section of this presentation today is I know how to draw, right? I know how to draw force. I got force form and shape. I know anatomy. I draw pretty well. Man, look at all the tools I have at my disposal to come up with a concept. So I have this idea. What do I do next? It's not what I do next. It's more of like, what are the traps that I could fall into? So Swami Matunjay and I, from this point forward, what we're gonna now talk about is the traps that we see students fall into when they draw from the imagination. Um, one of the first ones I see is problems with silhouettes, right? So as soon as you leave reference and you're in control now, total control, there's no excuse for bad silhouette because you're drawing from your imagination. So fix the drawing, right? Make sure that you don't end up in a problem. These are all pretty clear silhouettes. I can, put, there's enough of each object here, if it's a person or a dragon or Captain America, that I can look at and make out what's going on. A little funny back here with the legs on the dragon. I'm like, mm, that's kind of weird. There's two little things sticking out of the side there. I'm guessing it's the feet, but things get a little lost over here. Right? It almost feels like a genie because of that, right? Because I don't see the legs at all. The Captain America, we don't see the arm, but there's enough of the shoulder here and an angle on the arm for me to make out that it comes across here and goes behind. There's enough of the legs here for me to understand how he's standing. There's enough torso for, he, for me here with the legs to understand that. Where does this not go that well? This arm isn't that great. Right? If you look at this arm and we look at the silhouette of it, it looks like he has a stump sticking out of the side of his body. Right? So that's not that great. Let's see if we can fix it right? while we're here. Let me get my force uh, animator's notes brush. It's kind of like the inker. Um, so this is not good. It helps to see the joints. I've got to say your elbow joints, your knee joints really, really helps quite a bit. Right? So let's erase this. Right, and say, you know what, instead, I'm going to do something like this. Right now I can see the arm, I could see this joint, I could even bend this a little more like that, you see, really see the bend in the arm. I've also implied depth, by the way, just through silhouette, right? How do I do that? Because it's bigger up here and smaller down here. So I'm kind of insinuating this and this, you see? And I did have that in my mind, by the way, while I created the silhouette, right? So to me, this silhouette is better than what was there because you see, if you just look at the shape of that, it looks kind of weird, right? There, I'm like, okay, I get it. I gave him the little bent wrist because that makes him feel more fierce. I always bend the wrist or more, right? <laughs> More, more, uh, 
toughness going on because of that. Uh, this feels fine, right? This feels fine. I could see arms and legs, everything's clear. You know, this feels really clear. This feels really clear. Look at the depth in the hands here, right? And I just took this as like cut out art from the internet, right? And look at the scale. Look at the fist and look at the other fist. Wow, remember we talked about scale and depth. So I could see it very clearly here, right? So you don't want to fall in that trap. This is a little funny. You know, you want to watch out for tangents. We all know that tangents are bad, right? So you, this isn't, you know, here the knee at least is digging into the arm. This could have been worse, right? Could have been worse. This could have been like almost down to a thin white line, right? It's just like barely touching each other. At least the knee is digging into uh, the forearm there, you see? So these are all pretty good. If I were to get to the dragon, hey, maybe we could fix up this dragon a little bit. Yeah, watching Game of Thrones last night without any spoilers. Uh, yeah, dragons, man, <laughs> play an important role uh, in these uh, in this new this new season. So maybe I put him out here, right? His foot's like this, all right? Something like that, and maybe the other one. Hmm. Let's see. I'm going to draw my way across here. See if I can get it to uh, come out. Right? Maybe. Maybe I get here. This way, at least I can imply that it's there. So I'm not crazy about that. Right? The best thing would just be to get the other darn leg on the other side. Right? Just make it simple. Maybe. Maybe I raise it so it's in a cooler pose. Maybe it's like this. So let's thin out the tail here, like that. You know, so maybe it's something like that, you see? It's a little more heroic again, right? So better, better than before. I couldn't tell really what was going on. You see, it's all, it's all really jumbled in there, right? So that's what we're talking about. You know, if you're in control, you have the ability to, to do your drawings. A great way of doing this, by the way, is after you do like a sketch, fill it in. You know, even with a light gray tone, you don't even have to go this black, right? Just fill it in so you can see the silhouette, you know, and start training your brain to see the simplicity of the whole body. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that nothing can ever cross the body, by the way. That's at least when I'm teaching this, I always end up thinking if I was a student, I'd be asking like, hey, Mike, does everyone have to stand like the letter X then? Like, you know, is it that boring? No, it's not that boring. You know, like you could have a body that's like this, a torso. You know, let's zoom in on this. All right. So you could have a torso that's like this and say, I want to put an arm across it. Sure. But it really helps to have at least some part of the elbow there and then have the hand sticking out somewhere else. You see, my, our brains will put that together. Right, the human mind will say, well, there must be a way across here. That's what's happening, right? So you can do that, okay? All right, that's it for my segment. I'm gonna move it on to um, the Sunjay. Let me give you guys both uh, co-host control here. And uh, yeah, and then like I said, I'll be in the chat if you guys have any other further questions about this segment. So silhouette, right? And then we talked about how to come up with creative ideas. All right, all yours, Return J. Welcome, Return J. By the way, I'm glad uh, you got past the was a power outage or something you said. Yeah, finally here. Just uh... <laughs> so I'm actually seeking a, I'm uh, actually seek, uh, sneaking into my friend's apartment, you know, to get the wow. power. <laughs> wow. And well, thank you. Yeah, I have uh, made some awesome presentation. I don't want to miss it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So cool. Yes, um, hello, <laughs> finally here. Uh, so after silhouette, you know, after um, all the amazing, just like thinking, you know, you got, then uh, you got to thinking about the practical stuff, you know, that like how you're applying it. And the first one is the silhouette, right? We talked about it. Um, great one, Mike, by the way, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, now, the second one, yeah. And the second one would be the mechanics, okay? <laughs> Uh, this is uh, one of the parts where, like, uh, you know, when you draw from imagination, this is, uh, I think, the most uh, dingly dangly thing, you know, that goes into your mind is like how much to put, right? And uh, there, there's a fine line between, like, let's say, exaggeration and, um, you know, when you like bro broke the pose down, okay? 
So even when you exaggerate things, you know, basically what happens is like you still want to, I know it's kind of sounds absurd a little bit, but you still want to exaggerate within the limit so that it doesn't look like uh, the body's broken down, okay? Like you broke the joints of it, okay? So that's the mechanics. I, I actually just um, copied and pasted this uh, definition from Google and it says, um, as you can see, it's written, body mechanics is a term used to describe the way we move, right? As we go about our daily lives, um, lose how we hold our bodies when we sit, stand, lift, carry, bend, and sleep while well, they're just counting a few of them. Well, uh, while you're doing it from imagination, yeah, you're just dealing with every kind of motion, right? Running and sleeping and jumping. And yeah, there are like million other, uh, millions of others poses that you can think of or like the jobs that you can think of. Well, uh, when you're like drawing the body, right? So whatever, uh, whatever is happening, the way the body's functioning is that what we call um, basically the body mechanics, right? Uh, and you can see uh, in the last description, like poor body mechanics are often cause of back problems, <laughs> cause of uh, cause of back problems, yes. Uh, but uh, the thing is, I just took that part just because I want to show that whether it's causing back problems in real life or not, well, <laughs> it's definitely going to cost you some bad posture in your drawings, right? <laughs> so you just want to be be careful about it, that they are not like breaking the body, okay? And this is the whole uh, conclusion of this segment, uh, like why the mechanics are so important while you're drawing from imagination, okay? So I'm just going to discuss like a, like a few, um, like a few body parts that I've seen like most people actually dealing um, the most problems with. And I'll be looking into Discord like recently, and there are like a lot of people just um, you know drawing from imagination in there, and there's a uh, all the time you know in uh, in the mentorships as well. This is the problem which I have seen, uh, which I've observed uh, in most of most of those guys. Okay, so the first one, uh, and there are many more by the way. I'm not gonna describe every mechanics, right? Every mechanics of the body. It will take me like at least for one hour. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, or stream, but the thing is, these are the most common ones where the people face the most problems, right? So the torso rotation, right? The first thing, um, people like take it to the crazy, crazy amount, right? <laughs> so you need to understand that, see there we have uh, a rib cage, okay? Like we basically, basically have the rib cage right here, okay? Uh, this is the hard part, you know, we don't need to understand that this is, this is a bone, right? It's, it's a cage made out of bones. That's why it's called rib cage. And then we have the pelvis. Okay. So we have basically a pelvis like this. I'm just using a simple, simple structure for that right now. And the, and the part in the middle, right? This is what the, the soft part is, or I should just call it like the core of the body. Hmm? So everything happens, you know, everything, what you know about the torso, like the bending, squash, uh, twist, turn, torquing, okay, everything or the twisting, whatever, whatever you want to call it, like that happens actually here, you know, mostly. So this is the soft part, you know, like the, this part right here. Hmm, my shop is kind of lagging right now. But yeah, so this this part, actually, this is where uh, all the functioning is what really happening. All the flexibility you see is like basically because of the core, okay? So uh, people take it to like crazy amount. <laughs> it's like, for example, I'm just going to show an example where uh, you might be breaking uh, the torso, right? For example, something like this, right? <laughs> something like this, let's say, for example, right? That would be maybe too much, right? You're like basically pulling off the skin too much. And then, oh, you see like the belly button, right? It's taking that shape. And so because these two points would be coming closer, you're basically creating a very heavy squash in here. And you see, um, yeah, not looking right at all, right? Um, yeah, for for the most flexible person on the on the planet, might be, but uh, not in the common terms. Okay, you also want to draw uh, people from imagination and draw figures from imagination, but looks believable, right? Which, uh, which is again what Mike was saying that you just need to with the story, you just need to get connected. Okay, uh, so if you didn't don't get connected to it, which means if it's not like generalized, uh, it made for like generalized uh, understanding, then you know you might be feeling mistakes in it, right? So first thing, torso rotation. Um, hey, this is a really. I, I want to just say that, that this is really great. Like, I guarantee if we look online, we can find how many how many degrees of rotation does a normal human body take. 
And I, I have to say, you know, be aware you have a human body, <laughs> right? So get up and try to turn it, right? And see like, how far do you go? You don't have to do the research on this. You know, a lot of this mechanic stuff that's, that Matunji is bringing up is, is common sense, but yet we see this happen often, right? And, and, I, and I've been here, I, by the way, I'm, I'm totally guilty of this as well. Uh, but the easiest answer, just get up, you know, find out how far does your arm go, your elbow go, your knee go, your torso go, the rotation, you know, like, how does this all work? You have your own body, like, find out, right, without hurting yourself, <laughs> find out how far it goes, right? Thank you, Mr. Jay. Yeah, yeah that's really great. Uh, we are human beings, you know, so just, like, go and test yourself out. Don't do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be good. <laughs> all right. Um, now. The head rotation. Okay, I'll uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about the arm, our arm mechanics first. Uh, again, one of the places where I feel you know people are just uh, kind of doing it wrong most of the time. So um, one of the mistakes that people are doing is it's uh, it's basically in the force side of things. Okay, like like here, uh, I'm talking about force side of things uh, versus the mechanic side of things. You know. What the force side of things is basically talking about the rhythms of it, okay? So what people do is they basically put the force on the bicep side of things, okay? Which is, again, the, the breaking of the rhythm. And breaking of the rhythms directly means breaking of the function, okay, of the body. Now, people usually do this, by the way. Um, the general template of the arm goes like this, by the way, okay? Deltoid and to the back of the arm, okay? This is what the general template of the arm looks like. What people re usually do is... Oh, because the bicep is a curve, it, it looks uh, like a curve, right? It's a, it's a big muscle, it's a superstar muscle of the muscle world. <laughs> so people do it like this, right? Um, well, not going to work, right? Because the arm is, uh, remember, the arm is only bending forward this way, okay? And that's why the tricep needs to, like, push the arm forward, okay? Which means that, um, yeah, and the force is on the backside of the arm, okay? Again, uh, if you break the rhythms, you're breaking the template, you're breaking the template, you're breaking the function of that particular part of the body, okay? Um, uh, the limitation of the arm that you need to understand that it goes a little bit of uh, on a side, which is called hyperextension, okay? So your arm can actually do this, by the way. So it can bend a little bit backwards while still keeping your upper arm straight. You know, I'm talking about the forearm here. It can bend a little bit backwards like this, um, you know? But the thing is, this is where the locked position would come in, okay? So you can't actually do this, by the way. What I'm doing in the red right now, you can't actually do this, okay? Not too much, just a little bit where the arm just uh, get locked, gets locked, okay? So this is, again, um, the limitation. Just like Mike said, you know, you, if you do some, some research about it, like how many degrees or something like that, uh, and it's not fixed, it's not like a particular number, but it's like a range where... And you know, between that, uh, your arm or any of the joints would work, okay? Um, yeah, so there we go. No, so don't break the arms, right? Don't break the forces of the arm. That is what I've seen, you know, <laughs> very, very commonly. Okay, uh, the leg mechanics, right? <laughs> this is again one of the very common places where the where people like, uh, you know, do a lot of mistakes. Um, so what our what our leg can do, right? If I'm just like making a very simple, simple rhythm here, it's like a like a front to the back. I'm just gonna put a feet very well. Yeah, I'm gonna do a front to the back. Remember that our legs can bend backwards like this, okay, like this, and can go this way. If you observe, uh, it is doing what the arm what the arm it is doing the opposite of what the arm is doing, right? Remember the the arm is bending forward this way, okay, this way while the leg is bending backwards, okay? So you see the contradiction here, the contrast here, okay? That is why the force is on the back side of the arm, the tricep side of the arm, the elbow side of the arm, and in the leg, the force is in the front side of the arm, okay? So basically, you know, what I can do, I can convert this into an arm, <laughs> you know, in a way. It's like, oh, no, here's a bicep and here's a tricep, okay? So the front of that is kind of comparable to the triceps, while uh, the hamstring, which are the back muscles of the leg, is comparable to the bicep, okay, which never have force, okay, so kind of like that. So a good comparison to remember, okay, uh, remember mm, the arm is doing what leg is not doing, okay, leg is doing the opposite thing, leg bends backwards, arm bends forward, okay. 
two things no. I'd like to add in there. Um, yeah. Both of these joints are hinge joints, right? And the hinge can only go so far, just like a, a door does, right? And you really can't break that 90 degree moment, basically going in the opposite direction of the bend. So you'll break your elbow, you'll break your knee, right? If you go beyond it. Uh, and from a more biological standpoint or anatomical, uh, yeah, like Mutunje said, the hamstrings actually are called bicep femoris. So that's no accident. Right. So you have the bicep to your arm, you got the bicep to your legs, right? So their function is the same. It's, it's bringing uh, the bones closer together, right? That's what they do. And then the quadriceps and the triceps, they end up bringing the bones further apart, meaning the upper bone and the lower bone, if it's the arm or the legs, right? But a lot of this is joint based, you know, like um, Ratunjay is drawing right now. It's about knowing the joints and the joints really end up controlling that movement, right? And you, that you can't break the joint. Yep, exactly. I just uh, did a simple illustration to represent what a hinge joint is like, right? It's basically just uh, between the two, it just like moves, right? And it's got its limitation in the in body. All right. Um, so we got the torso rotation. We uh, got the arm and the, and the knee, I mean, in the leg. There's, uh, so I'm just going to give some time to Swindy as well, okay? <laughs> uh, but these are the main ones, guys, okay? Again, remember, you want to draw from imagination. Just just first know the limitations of what your body can do, okay? And then work accordingly. Um, all right, so I hope you like this uh, small like, little <laughs> lecture on the mechanics of the human body. And uh, uh, hope you like it. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Yes, thank you. All right, so let's close off with uh, another aspect that is also super important, which is, of course, proportions. We need to have a, a sense of what are the, the different lengths of the body parts relative to each other. So um, we can draw uh, and invent, again, like Mitunja mentioned, believable figures. And of course, you can stylize and exaggerate, but just like with anything, it has to start based on reality. You know, you need like a like a real starting point. So, and I don't think Don mentioned it as well. You have to be able to know when you've gone too far. That's when things uh, stop working. And the same with this with proportions. So, if you look around out there, you will see um, the general proportions of the figure. And with this, I want to emphasize that this is just a guide. You know, it's not an absolute rule, meaning that it just gives you a starting point. But if you go out and observe uh, individuals, you will see that some people come pretty close to the general proportions, but you will find enough people that uh, deviate tremendously from them. So this is a starting point that you can use, but don't just draw generic figures. You know, you want to. Uh, at the end, go out and observe real humans, and then you can use the general proportions as like your main reference point and say, okay, this person is shorter than the generic figure, or they have longer legs, or they have a longer torso than the generic figure. So if you look out there, um, if you look at the Loomis books or the How to Draw comic books, you will find that there are there are a couple of of uh, of systems, um, like one of the most common ones I would say is head lengths, you know. And even with this, I've seen variations. Like some some books teach that a figure is uh, seven and a half half uh, heads long. Some with some is eight. I like to use eight heads because it's an even number, and especially once you go to drawing in perspective. Uh, for me, it's even to control because what I would do is I think of, of the whole body as, as a simple stick. You know, so you have the stick, then you can say, okay, I want my figure to be this long. And then if it's eight heads, I know that I can divide it in half. Then I can divide this in half again, I can divide this in half, and then I have the whole figure. You know, so I find this pretty, pretty easy. And since it's a guideline anyway, this just gives me a starting point to go with. So if we if we use the eight heads, uh, the eight head system, 
we can see that and I kept the, I kept this pretty simple here. No, I think Mike and Mitunje talked about uh, the gravity guides last week, which is simply like think of the torso as like a bean or flower sack and having these simple sticks for the limbs and the neck. So notice that um, the halfway point is, is typically um, it's typically the, the crotch actually or, or the pubic bone. That is the halfway point. And talking about the divisions, notice that um, uh, this, this to this, so the top of the head to let's say the, the crotch is as long as the distance from the crotch uh, to the legs, you know, so this already hierarchically gives you like a good comparison. You can compare the top half of the figure to the bottom half of the figure, you know, so that's number one. And then it's interesting also to notice that the elbow joints line up with, uh, with the bottom of, of the tent ribs. And typically the wrists uh, tend to line up with uh, with the crotch and the hands come uh, about like halfway the length of the thigh. You know, so that's those are handy proportions uh, to keep in mind. And uh, of course, you want to understand the width of the figure. Like we talk, we talk about head lengths, but what's the width, right? So if you notice here, the figure is about it's about three heads wide now again just a guideline some people are uh can be uh, have like a wider build and some can be uh more slender builds but it's about three heads and one thing to really keep in mind is the width of the shoulders like this an area that i see uh students missing a lot they draw they draw the shoulders like way too narrow now they would draw they would draw the upper torso for example and then, then they draw like the shoulder like this and the arm is like this, you know, and I always bring up the idea of a, uh, of an action figure or, or a toy, meaning that you would have, you would have these sockets at the sides, right, for, for the arms and then the arms, like the deltoid has volume. So this really, this really sticks out, you know. So keep in mind the, the width of the shoulders and that the shoulders are wider than just the width of the upper body, you know, the width of the uh, upper torso, I should say. So keep in mind the shoulder width. And once we get to the sides, um, the width of the torso from a side view is about uh, the width of the head, you know, and of course, from the front, the head is narrower. Once we look at it from the side, it's it fits more into into a square. Yeah, you know, so notice that it's about it's about the same width. You know, so that's also a good guideline uh, to keep in mind. And other things that are pretty useful, uh, especially with the legs. I was just pointing this out to students today who uh, drew the legs, the lower leg, to uh too short like typically if you if you go down on your knees for example and you sit in this position typically uh your heel actually let me redraw this your heel would touch the rear ends now so your foot would be like here so when i look at legs especially when looking at students work i automatically look at this i visualize this in my mind and what often happens is that students would draw the lower leg too small so that if we were to bend the lower leg, maybe maybe the foot would end up here, you know? So this, this wouldn't work. Imagine trying to go and, and sit on your knees and your lower leg is this short, wouldn't function, right? So keep that in mind for the legs. Like if you fold your legs, the heel would be touching the rear ends and uh, from the thigh joint to the knee joint is kind of as long as from the knee joint to the ankle joint. Now you have like this, this triangulation that is going on. Now it's same with the arms. If you bend your arms, for example, uh, like you will see that this length is about the same and you can, you can like bring your hand here and touch your shoulder. 
So this is also uh, something handy to keep in mind. And of course, the elbow would line up with the bottom of the uh, of of the ribs. So that's number one. And then we have the difference between male and female. So in general, again, this is just a guideline in general. If you look at books out there, you will see that uh, females are drawn a bit shorter than males. You know, still eight heads long, but just a bit shorter than the male figure. And um, the torso is kind of like uh, the opposite, meaning that in males, uh, it tends to be like a wider upper body with a narrow pelvis. And with female, of course, you get the hourglass shape, meaning that the upper body is narrower and the pelvis, the pelvis then gets wider. You know, so you get like the characteristic hourglass shape out of that. And then we have some um, handy landmarks to keep in mind. Uh, for example, uh, you have the arc of the ribs. You know, so usually you can see you can see the triangle. And you can see the bottom of the tent ribs sticking out. You can see the uh, corner of the pelvis, which is called the iliac crest. So, and you have the pit of the neck, of course, at the front. And keep in mind that the arms actually attach to the pit of the neck. You know, so this really the point where the arms uh, move from. And you can also use the joints themselves as landmarks. Like where are the shoulder joints and where are the elbow joints and the wrist joints, you know, the knee joints, the ankle joints. All of those can be used as, as landmarks to help you keep track of proportions. Uh, at the back, you have the seven cervical vertebrae. If you put your hand to the back of your neck, you probably can feel that bone sticking out. This gives you the base of the, uh, uh, this gives you the base of the neck. Uh, from the back view, the shoulder blades are also important. And usually, usually we can see uh, like the, the edge of the shoulder blades like showing up at the back. And you have um, like a small triangle at the back. This is most visible, I think, in, in females. You now you will see uh, like these, these landmarks. You know, it's a combination of the pelvis bone and, and the gluteus muscles that create this, this smaller triangle. So also a good uh, a triangle to keep in mind to help you with the structure. And last but not least, I just want to show you guys a quick demo in how to do this in perspective. So here I drew a ground plane and a vertical on that ground plane. So remember, I said at the beginning that I think of the human figure as, as a stick. You know, so I have... I have this height, which I can then divide in half, and I keep I can divide it in half again until I have the uh, the eight heads. So now we can use this as a guide to sketch in perspective. So we know that the bottom of the uh, the bottom of the torso will end up at the halfway point approximately. You now, so that would be here. So we can add the V shape. We can add the turning edge. And then we can go for the legs. So here I'm drawing with, with force, form, and shape, obviously. And we can use some wrapping in there. And now when we're drawing the gesture, we want to keep things uh, loose and forceful. You know, everything is subject to change. This is just your first pass. You now we can get we can get the arms in here. Again, they line up with, with the bottom of the uh, of the torso. And speaking about silhouettes, I want this arm to be far enough from the body so, so it reads well. So let's put it here. And then we can add the neck and head. Now, again, making sure that the figure keeps in line with the perspective, of course. So hopefully this uh, helps you guys with some basic guidelines on the, how to draw from imagination, starting with ideas understanding body mechanics, and last but not least, um, having some general proportions in mind that you can uh, use as a starting point to get uh, believable figures. All right, okay. awesome. Thank you, Swanley. Yeah, you're welcome.
So, you know, in closing today, guys, um, this video assumes a lot. This assumes that you know force, you know form, you know shape. So I just want to reiterate, you know, drawing with force, finding those rhythms in the body, that really is that first step, right? The fact that you know how to use the system of rhythm to get through a whole body and make it believable uh, and how that fully connected uh, chain link of events is happening is really the first thing. That, that's one of the things that's so powerful about, I think, learning the force drawing approach. Uh, we're giving you stuff beyond that, right? Today has really been about how do I come up with ideas? You know, watch out for the silhouettes as you're starting to draw those forces and making poses. What do the silhouettes look like? How does the body work? Making sure you understand the joints and that they don't break, right? That you don't do anything, you know, that's skeletally destructive uh, to your drawings. And then, you know, last but not least, uh, Swenley has hit us up with, here's some landmarks so you do get some of those proportions, right? Because you want to at least have some kind of guideposts in your head as to what you're hitting. Um, I was going to add to the guidepost thing really quick. Um, I always keep in mind that fingertips and the hands usually get to about the middle of the thigh in general. Like uh, Swenley said, you know, you're getting the end of the arm, like at the wrist to about the bottom of the pelvis and the hands about mid thigh. And also elbows are kind of at the bottom of the rib cage. So those are two things like I have in my mind as like simple markers, right? To help me as I'm drawing from imagination. Now, by the way, when you're drawing from imagination, the more you push um, depth, you know, perspective and space, there's more room to cheat, right? It's easier to not have to worry about all those proportions and the accuracy there because they get skewed, right? Things get foreshortened. So there's more room to play. So the, the irony there is the tougher drawings, meaning those that are foreshortened are though more forgiving when it comes to something like the rules of measurement and proportion, right? So that's the gift you get by going into foreshortening, okay? All right, guys, uh, that's it for today. Have an amazing weekend. Um, Return Jay Swanley and I will see you next Friday. If there's ever anything uh, specific, any subject you want us to discuss, we're always um, open to getting uh, your ideas, right? Talking about ideas. And uh, just email me, mike at drawingforce.com. Uh, and uh, otherwise, we'll see you next Friday. Take care. Thank you again, Swenly Mutunjay, and we will all see you next week. See you guys. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone.